Good afternoon. Aliens erupting from Sigourney Weaver's body scared us when we saw it on the big screen in Aliens. People panicked when they heard Orson Welles' War of the Worlds on the radio and thought aliens were taking over the planet. Then we were always told, don't worry, there's no such things as beings from another planet. But the people you're about to meet say, oh yes there are. Seattle nurse Cindy Lee says she encountered aliens locally right along Interstate 5. Healthcare executive Dave Jones says aliens implanted tracking devices in his body. While all this may sound unbelievable, Harvard professor of psychiatry Dr. John Mack says these people have not lost their minds. They are just among the millions of people who've been abducted by aliens. Hypnotherapist Sharon Philippe fits that bill. Sharon says aliens have been contacting her since she was just a tiny baby and in fact it goes back really to infancy doesn't it Sharon? That's true. Tell us about the very first one you can recall it and how were you able to call it to mind later? Uh, I have been involved as you just said throughout my lifetime but I didn't really become aware of the entire issue till I had an actual UFO sighting only 25 feet away and 50 feet up off the ground when I was a as teenager. As an adult or as a teenager? As a teenager. And that's when my recall started coming back as some unusual events that happened to me when I was a child. Uh, originally I thought my earliest experience was when I was three because I remembered seeing this tall being holding my hand and I had to ask my mom what the outfit I was wearing, how old was I, because I knew I was really little. Mm -hmm. And then I had uh, done some work on myself and discovered that I was in a bassinet looking up at this uh, blonde haired woman who I've never seen before or after that in my entire life and remember hearing the words that I will see you once again. To this day, I have no recollection of ever seeing this particular person again. But this has affected your life, if seeing these beings when you were a child. It made you afraid of certain things, didn't it? That's right. I was always very fearful of the dark. Uh, my mom used to have to cover the mirror at night because I used to see faces and people, I used to say, coming into my room. And so I had a very difficult time living what I would call a, a normal growing up life. Uh, in school, I was very quiet. I was a very introverted person. I didn't have much to do with other people. I kept to myself because I saw things that other people didn't see and was not aware of that. So now do you think you were seeing actually beings as opposed to um, having a vivid imagination? Absolutely. I'm positive of that. Tell us about the encounter as a teenager because that, that was much more vivid. Obviously, it, it left a lasting memory. Tell us about that encounter. I was driving home. I had a Triumph Spitfire, which was a foreign car at the time. And uh, it's only a bucket seat. It's only two passenger. And I'm stopping at a four-way traffic signal, Long Island, New York. And suddenly, I just felt that there was a presence up above. And the light was red. And I look out underneath from my window, looking up, and I see this giant UFO standing there, the typical saucer-shaped UFO. Mm -hmm. And my heart starts pounding from here out to there. And I say to myself, you're not seeing what you think you're seeing. And this was in the 1960s. Uh, I was not a drinker. I never took drugs. I never smoked. I'm a very dull person in all those areas. And so I you know, knew that I wasn't hallucinating. I didn't have some source to, were to you, see this. Were you terrified? Uh, I was very frightened. I wouldn't say I was terrified until I suddenly realized that the lights went on. At first it was very dark, but I could see the shape of it because it was above a street light. This was a residential area, so I was thinking that someone surely should see this and I should hear something about it on the news next day, but which I Not never a did. Mm. Did this go on then for you with some further or closer interaction with, with the people who were, or, or the, the beings who were on, aboard this vessel? Yes, at the time I didn't realize that I had been on board and it was later on uncovering information that I found out I actually did go on board with these beings and there were other people that were on board there as well. Other, other humans? Other humans that had been taken on board. Y you know, you mentioned that one of them was a woman. You remember that from when you were a child, and you brought along some uh, some sketches. Did, did the aliens look different every time? I have seen. I'll six just be holding these up to the camera if, if we can see yeah, them at all. The last one is not a picture, though. Right. Okay. okay. Um, this particular being was an incident that I recently had within the past two years, which was a very warm, loving incident. Uh, this is one of my clients, as a hypnotherapist, has seen that. That is a lizard type. Uh, this was a very frightening experience, one of the rare few. This was actual bone structure around the eyes. 
The eyes had pupils, but you see they're different from uh, the normal. Didn't you see large, six foot tall? I saw a six foot tall being, uh, which was tan in color. I've seen ant-like beings, which were three feet or under in size. I would sometimes see them what I would call interdimensionally because I would see them as silhouettes mm -hmm. and then I wouldn't remember the others. What do you remember about personalities or, or were you around them long enough to get an impression? When different beings would come in, you would get a different sensation as to whether you should be fearful or not fearful. There were many times in my life that I was absolutely so terrified that I thought I was going to die before anything might even happen. But you got these feelings with communication or because of communication? In what form would that communication take? The communication comes through their eyes. They talk to you through their eyes, for me at any rate. Mm -hmm. Some people hear communication uh, as if they're talking telepathy. Yeah, we've got some more people. We'll ask them how they communicate. That's interesting. I would but have thought it was the same. But with me, it's mostly through oh. the eyes, all the emotions, all the understanding. Um, and so with that in mind, when I had one incident which actually woke me up, I heard my name shouted in my head and woke me out of a sound sleep. And I saw a face. It wasn't the whole being. All I saw was a face. And this was a very frightening face. It had folds in the skin. And it had huge, large, black, um, almond-shaped eyes. And they were like black liquid. Mm. We've got to take a break right here. Sharon is not alone in her experiences. Up next, a man who says his childhood home became a UFO landing strip. Plus, a Harvard psychiatrist who believes aliens can abduct you. The stars of Hollywood, they are rich, they're famous, and now we're finding out they're neurotic. Find out how Marlon Brando used his shrink to psych out Frank Sinatra, and how Warren Beatty turned his sessions into a hit movie. Stars and their shrinks, Wednesday. So if someone walked up to you and claimed to have been abducted by an alien being, how would you react? Think twice before you answer that question uh, as you watch the rest of our program today. We have a phone caller on the line. Go ahead. You're on the air. Hi. Uh, Hi. My name's Cammie from Silverdale. Hi. And my question is, couldn't all these sightings and abductions and things, couldn't they be like a product of America's collective overactive imagination? That's got to be a very common <laughs> question, and I'll address it to Dr. John Mack, who has joined us on set. You must hear that question a lot, Dr. Mack. It's kind of the reverse of the usual kind of question because... Uh, we're a culture that's addicted to not believing in anything except what we can take pictures of or what's reported to police stations or what you can handle physically and the sightings are physical i mean they are the physical evidence or one of the forms of it and uh, there are just so many objectively covered sightings in all of the media and it seems to me that uh, uh, if we uh, deny our own media they become our eyes and ears then what are we to trust as having some reality in the external world. But tell us, tell us how you felt before you began working on this book and before you began working with these uh, experiencers, as you call them. Yeah, I mean, when I first heard about this phenomenon, that, and particularly about Bud Hopkins, the pioneer who investigated them most comprehensively initially in New York, uh, I thought, you know, there must be, this man must be out of his mind and this must be some new form of mental illness. And the colleague that brought me to see him said, no, no, it's real. It's something important going on here. So I reluctantly went to see him. And what I discovered from talking with him, and more significantly with the 90 people that I've worked with since that time, was uh, something that has created a powerful mystery for me. You, you've done a complete turnabout in your thinking. D I'm wondering if, Dave, if you thought you were losing your mind w when you spotted your first alien. Well. Uh of course. I mean, the, 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 the ironic thing was, is, you know, I'm 43 years old now, and two and a half years ago, coming to the reality of what really happened to me back as a child and through my teenage years. And you, you were six years old the first time in Spring, Springfield, old. Missouri, in Springfield, Missouri, on, on a farm. What happened? What do you remember? Well, what I remember at that time was uh, I was playing on the back porch with my sister. I have an older sister who's two years older than I am. And my father it was a dairy farm, and my father was had uh, finished milking the cows, and he was coming up from the the barn, 
to the house and I had gone off the porch out to greet him. And as I went off of the porch, I turned to my right where the house, the back of the house was, and I saw a horrible, a horrifying face on the wall. And I remember I immediately turned to my dad because I wanted to see if he saw it. There was no response from him, but then when I turned back to the face, it was like the eyes of this thing on the wall just penetrated me. Mm. I was paralyzed. And then the next thing I remember was turning back to my father and he was kind of, he, he, was, he was startled and I was frightened and he, said, he would ask me, what are you scared of? And he's kind of, you know, laughing a little bit. And I said, well, Dad, did you see the face on the wall? And he said, no, I don't see anything. I said, well, somebody was there with a Halloween mask or something. And he said, I didn't see a thing. Then the next thing I remember, we went into the house. And then my dad made the comment that, well, you know, it, t it took a lot longer to milk this evening than normal. But I started the regular time, and he couldn't figure out where the time went. There was like time 30, to 30, there. Yeah, 30 to 35 minutes of time lapsed. Doris in our audience has a comment. Doris? Yes, I was in the Air Force uh, in 1952 and I was with the Strategic Air Command and where we, in a very secure building where we literally, we tracked the, all of the planes that were in the area and the radar trackers there would literally call out UFO and they would track something mm -hmm. and uh, then it would just suddenly you know when it disappeared it disappeared they would be sometimes singly sometimes in there would be clusters of them did they comment on on the speeds uh, Doris at which they track these things because that's been one of the unique uh, parts of this phenomenon is these things are capable of incredible speeds uh, well the radar trackers all they ever did was call out UFO and then we would watch them and we would see them uh, move the little figures that they used to indicate uh, either a plane or whatever in this case what they called the UFO but to this mm -hmm. date the Air Force to my knowledge mm -hmm. does not acknowledge right. mm -hmm. that they have ever tracked them. Mm -hmm. One of the eerier things I've heard is is what happened to you just a few months ago with you, with what happened in your mouth tell us all about that yeah a, uh, it's kind of a gory thing I mean, I'm not going to get into the gory parts of oh, it, come but, on. but I, <laughs> you know but uh, it, it, it was frightening it was very frightening to me uh, I had been out I went out with a friend of mine early in the morning we played nine roll nine holes of golf I came back in to get cleaned up and for the last three days I had this piece of skin in my mouth that I've been messing with with my tongue and and I noticed that it was a white piece of skin across the bottom of my, my, my mouth. And my mouth was a little sore, but I didn't pay any that much attention to it. So what I did, I took a piece of, I took a pair of tweezers and I just pulled a piece of skin that was loose and it, it came open. And I mean, it really came, I'm not gonna get into the whole gory part of it, but it came open, I got the bleeding stopped. I went right to my office. I told the people in the office, I, I had called and made an appointment with my, my physician, who's an internist. I uh, went to, uh, I showed it to a couple of the people in the office, they, it, was, it was really bad, and then I went to the doctor's office, he looked at it, and the first thing he asked me, he said, have you had mouth surgery recently? And I said, no, not at all. And he said, well, it's cut, and it's been mm -hmm. cut very precise with a very sharp... Uh, like, like with a surgical instrument. Right, or like with a surgical in instrument, and I'll never forget this, he took his bifocals off, he sat down on the bench, he says, well, then I don't know what happened. And I tell you, for me to, to inflict injury on myself, I've been through C-sections with my children and passing out. I see a needle I pass out. I see blood I pass out. I, I was having a hard time dealing with this. So thing. what do you think it was? Well, the next thing I knew, five days later, the skin graft was back over it again, and in three days it healed up. But I went back through another regression to find out, you know, I, I had to find out what happened and during that regression, the tall aliens came in, cut my mouth open, and they took a small gray uh, cylinder-like type of device out of my mouth. Hmm. And, that, and there's a place there neck, down next to the, my jaw inside my mouth that had always been there. It's been there for, I, had, I remember when I was in my 20s, I had a dentist look at it. He said it's just part of the bone, but it's not part of the bone, it's gone. We'll take a short break. John Mack has also asked about physical evidence a great deal. We'll talk more about that when we come back 
Also, we'll localize it. Are, are aliens making contact with people here in the Northwest? We'll hear one woman's encounter that took place right on Interstate 5. We'll be back. Next week, go with us to London, England for some of the most compelling stories we've ever presented. Royal Insiders give us the inside scoop on Prince Charles and Princess Diana. Clairvoyants take us through a castle on a haunting. And we reveal who Jack the Ripper really was. That's Northwest Afternoon from London all next week. Dave was just telling us how he believes aliens implanted something in his mouth and then maybe took it out. But this was not so unusual. From reading your book, it sounds like there are a lot of surgical implants being performed. Yes, this may be uh, one of the more dramatic examples, but uh, case after case, the uh, person will remember in hypnosis or without hypnosis that some kind of device was placed in their nose or in the vagina or in the penis in the case of one man. Uh, and they feel that they've been tagged, much the way we tag animals in a herd when we want to be able to track them. It's the experiences that they are doing this so they can be found again, and sometimes they will abduct the person, remove the implant, as occurred in this example Dave gave, put in another device, but the idea behind this appears to be some way to monitor or keep track of the people that they're working with. Because they don't just have one encounter, it seems like they have them over and over and over then throughout their life. Mm -hmm. Cindy in our audience uh, had an encounter when you were on I-5 near Mount Vernon and something a little bit weird happened. Tell us about that. <laughs> well, I was actually on my way home at night, about 11 o'clock at night. I had been visiting my mother who had a cerebral hemorrhage. She had uh, cancer that was exacerbated. And I was about 10 miles south of Mount Vernon when I noticed this object that was about to the right of the freeway approximately 50 to 60 feet above the ground and I could tell because of the treetop level most firs are anywhere from 50 to 75 feet tall and I was observing the shape of the craft the size of the craft and the lights that were moving sequentially in a circular sequential motion around this craft and I thought that was very unusual and the closer I got to it I was eliminating things that it could be first I thought it could be a dirigible well I had my window down it was a quiet, calm night, and the closer I got to it, I couldn't hear anything. It was totally silent. Then I knew it couldn't be an airplane. Couldn't, so, be, couldn't be a helicopter. Well, that was my last alternative. So didn't you stop the car? I was trying to. <laughs> what you the closer I got to it, I realized it wasn't a helicopter either. But the, the size of the craft appeared to be that of a Chinook helicopter, al although it was a little bit larger. At that point, I realized it was not a craft that we had designed. It was, I, I just knew that it wasn't. That, that humans had designed it. Correct. And the lights that were moving around it, and as I came upon it, I realized it was a sphere. So I made the conscious decision to pull over, and I am very conscious of my body position when I'm driving. I knew exactly what position I was in as I was getting ready to pull off the freeway to get out and look at this thing. It's as if, it's hard to explain. One second later, I'm 10 miles down the road and I'm driving in a totally different position. And I verbally spoke to myself out loud. That was interesting. Let's take a phone call. Uh, Go ahead, caller. Hi, I was wondering, um, why do you think they never reveal themselves to everybody instead of just one person at a time? Dr. Mack? Now, this question comes up often, what is, uh, what is alien motivation and intention? And that's what we know the least about. Uh, the question presumes that in some way we accept the reality of it, and I think as we accept the reality of this phenomenon, whatever that means, in other words, uh, whether it's from some other dimension entering our dimension, but something important is going on here, and we open to it, I believe that they will become less subtle. Right now, they fear us. We attack them when they show up. We, we are frightened of them. We try to, uh, experiences actually have, uh, swing their fists at them, try to knock them down. Uh, so they're, they're worried about us. They paralyze us because they're doing things that are distressing to us, and then we, in turn, understandably, react with fear and aggression. So as we begin to open our spirits or open our souls to whatever reality this is, uh, and when that happens with the people that I work with, they become less aggressive, they show up more powerfully, and maybe at some point they will 
allow themselves to be better known to us. But right now, they feel, or whatever this is, their intention is, I don't know, but they enter our world in a subtle way. They don't make themselves fully manifest. And I don't know why that is, except what I said. Travis in the audience with a question or comment. Go ahead. Um, why do you believe people are being abducted by aliens? Well, again, that's kind of like the last question. Pur purpose uh, and intent, yeah. It, it, I don't know the purpose. I know what the basic structure of the experience is, which has three parts to it. It has this breeding program, which appears like a joining of our species, which is very densely embodied, and the alien species, which is much less densely embodied, which seems to be a very difficult project because the hybrids don't seem to be very vigorous. So that's one thing. Second is there is some kind of information exchange going on. They are conveying to us on monitors and telepathically that the destruction we are wreaking upon the Earth is causing damage that is affecting the cosmos, is not just an Earth-level damage. And the third dimension is, in some way, this is opening the experiences, people like Dave and Cindy and Sharon, to a higher dimension, a higher sense of themselves, mm -hmm some kind of spiritual opening evolutionary processes occurring. So those seem to be the three effects of what they do. We've but whether that's their intention or not, I'm not sure. We've got to break away for a moment. Are aliens our enemies or are they our friends? We'll find out when we come back. a beautiful sister or friend who always gets the best in life while you get the leftovers? Are you an attractive woman who gets treated differently because of your looks? If you or someone you know is plagued by their own beauty, please call 421 Live right after today's show. I understand Cindy Crawford just called a moment oh, ago. Right. <laughs> we keep coming back to the question of, of intent with, uh, with the alien abduction phenomenon. And I wonder, Sharon, if uh, it ever became clear to you what the purpose was for the contact that you had from, from alien beings. Actually, I, I think I have partial answers to that. Um, my thoughts in the beginning were that I was being a victim, I was being violated and things had turned around for me. Uh, with saying that I saw six different types, we didn't get into a lot of the details. Right. And as I grew older, I was being given information back to me rather than something taken from me. What, what, what kind of information? Uh, it's a learning of what you are to do in this world, how you are to help others, how you are to help the planet, what needs to be done. And as Dr. Max said, it's a, it's a spiritual thing as well. So they're not our enemies. That's uh, not to say that all of them are yeah. like that. Yeah, I, I uh, rather than soap opera, I, I've been accused of getting on a soap box around this. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I have to be a little careful with myself here. But my sense is that something and stay with me here, something in the individuals can be paralleled in the culture. In other words, as the individuals go deeper into their own experience, acknowledge that it has some truth, even though it's a mystery, they don't know what it is, some kind of spiritual opening, some kind of expansion of the sense of self occurs, which is constructive, creative. And I think we could maybe do that in the culture. In other words, if we could just get beyond this, are they here, are they good, we're scared of them, what are they doing, let's, let's shoot the messenger that tells us they exist, let's deny the whole thing. And didn't we could didn't really you have to do it. that to write the book? Yes, if I went through this too. And I think we could as a culture maybe, if we could acknowledge that maybe there are other intelligences out there. They may not take the form that we were taught in Sunday school, but maybe if we could admit there is some intelligence that we are living in a universe that is not dead and lifeless except on Sundays uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but actually contains beings that in spirits that all other cultures around the world know and have no and our culture knew it until 300 years ago uh, that if we could admit that reality maybe we could open to some kind of deeper experience of our own, learn to live in harmony more fully with other life forms here, and maybe some growth as a collective could take place. You know? do, you, do you feel positive about your encounters? Oh, I feel very positive. I feel like for my own inner self, it has developed me to bring out all my talents, my ability to do what I, what I do as a human being. And one thing I've learned through all the experiences is as you get up every day, the universe has gone forward. If you're going to stay stuck, that's your problem. 
I'm not going to stay stuck in this problem. I'm going forward. The reason I'm speaking out is because I've met other people that's had this experience. They're shut down. They're shut inside. Mm -hmm. They've got to come out. For myself, it's very positive. It's like uh, one great quote that uh, even if you're on the right track, you're going to get run over if you just sit there. Uh, <laughs> it, it still takes some risk for people like you to come out and talk about these things because there, there's the risk of just being labeled a nut or a lunatic. There had to be great risk for you, Dr. Mack, in writing the book yeah. among your professional colleagues. And I wish we had more time to yeah. Can I say one thing? Qu quickly. When, you when you take a risk, other people take risks too, like Dave right. and Sharon and you two for having us on here. So, yeah. you know, you're risking something Th as thanks well. Thanks for joining us today. Cindy, thank you. We'll be back after this break. Dr. John Mack's book, Abduction, can be found at local bookstores.